the litany of issues that are coming out now uh, as a result of this clot shot, or is actually I prefer to call it now the death shot, um, given how many people are dying. I am a husband, a father, a lawyer, a Christian, and a proud Canadian. I started this series because it was clear that our nation needs truth. Not just another biased narrative, but real information of substance. We need access to facts and the freedom to think for ourselves. I'm Leighton Gray, and this is Gray Matter. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Gray Matter. Well, if you're like me, you were raised uh, in, a, in a family and in a community where the family doctor was perhaps the most trusted person uh, in your entire community. But what happens when we begin to live in a society where we can no longer trust doctors uh, to tell us the truth? What happens when we live in a world where if we go and see a doctor to ask them about the potential health effects of an experimental gene therapy, the doctor has to say that they cannot give us advice about that because they're under the threat of, of suspension and sanctioned by the medical college. Well, and, and, and also what happens when we have doctors who speak out, who step outside of that and bravely warn the public, some of them shouting it from the rooftops, um, and they are the ones who are sanctioned. They are the ones who are ostracized by the medical community. Well, today on the program, we have an eminent doctor, uh, an Alberta doctor who is one of those who has spoken out. He's been very, very consistent about it. So we welcome to the program, Dr. Roger Hawkinson. Thanks for joining us, Roger. Thank you, Leighton. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, we're going to get at some really fascinating topics with Roger, who has uh, deep insights into the science of vaccines um, that most people don't know about. He's also working with uh, a company called the Wellness Company that is actually developing ways of helping people suffering from vaccine injury cope with that and, and even detoxify their body. So that's going to be very fascinating for people to learn about. Before we introduce it properly, as we always do, we're going to go to our framing aphorisms. Um, of course, these are chosen in uh, Roger's honor. I've had the pleasure of getting to know him fairly well over the past few years. It's been my privilege to do so. Uh, he and I share uh, a love of uh, Sir Winston Churchill. Uh, one of his uh, quotations among many, it's so hard to pick uh, the best ones, but one of them that I like is this one. It says, some people's idea of free speech is that they are free to say what they like, but if anyone says anything back, that is an outrage. That seems uh, very, very true of society today, and it applies to doctors, certainly. The second one is from Hippocrates, who is sort of the, the great-grandfather of all doctors uh, from ancient Greece, who said, whenever a doctor cannot do good, he must keep from doing harm. And finally, from Sir Isaac Newton, uh, the, the sort of the, the great uh, author, uh, beginner of modern science and modern scientific method, who wrote, to me, there has never been a higher source of earthly honor or distinction than that connected with advances in science. And finally, one from our guest, Dr. Roger Hodkinson, who said, this is the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on an unsuspected public, speaking about the COVID-19 pandemic, quote unquote. So who do we have on the show today? Well, Dr. Hodgkinson is a Cambridge University trained medical doctor, board certified uh, a pathologist in both the United States and Canada. He immigrated to Canada in 1970. His career has spanned general medical practice, community hospitals, academia, and entrepreneurial business. He was an assistant professor in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Alberta the former chairman of the examination committee for general pathology at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Ottawa, and also CEO and medical director of Western Medical Assessments in Edmonton, Canada, where he still works. For many years, he has been a public health advocate. He was the honorary chairman of Action on Smoking and Health, or ASH, a nonprofit organization in Canada, tracking the predatory marketing strategies of big tobacco and for which he was made Citizen of the Year in Edmonton uh, in 1994. Uh, he's also involved in a new company as an executive chairman of uh, Mutant DX, which is a liquid biopsy company based in North Carolina. And here it, they're involved in molecular diagnostics for early cancer detection, 
uh, which uh, unfortunately due to the vaccines is becoming uh, more and more prevalent and more, more and more important and necessary. He, um, throughout the pandemic, uh, Dr. Hodgkinson, like many other experts, uh, has been passionately speaking out against the unscientific draconian measures in Canada and the world. He has followed the evidence as he was trained to do and teaches others to do and for that he has been attacked by the media and health authorities. So, Roger, I've quoted you once. I'm going to quote you one more time and then get your take. Uh, this is from you on the Internet, and I know lots of things in the true aren't uh, uh, authentic, but I actually heard you say this on another show. You said, quote, never forgive, never forget. You said, I am vengeful. I want punishment to these bastards who hurt people with COVID mandates, uh, COVID madness. I want vengeance. I want them all jailed. No forgive and forget. What were you talking about there? Well, you're, the quote is incomplete. I said I want them hung and I would pull the lever. Wow. We are talking about murder here on a massive scale. The number of people that have died from this so-called vaccine is just catastrophic. In the states where the stats are better than in Canada, we're talking about in the region of 500 to 800,000 thousand people who would be alive today if this mad episode in human history had not taken place. We're talking about murder here on a gigantic scale, about 20 million internationally. Right. That's the number that I heard on an Alex Jones prog program recently. Yes. And those, those numbers have been corroborated by independent sources. This is a scale of murder, outright murder. It's going on still today. It hasn't stopped. Pregnant women are being injected with this stuff today. Children are being injected with this stuff today. In Britain, that keeps the best stats on childhood mortality, Last year, there was a 22% increase in childhood mortality. And we're attributing that directly to this genetic therapy. Those are just capsule statistics. People's eyes glaze over when you start using zeros and whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nothing like this has ever come close in medical history. We've normally taken a, 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 an ordinary vaccine off the market with 35 deaths, 3-5. We're now talking about 20 million, and it's still going on. That is murder. And the, the penalty for murder used to be, you'll appreciate this, uh, Leighton, as a, as, a, as a lawyer. In Britain, when the death sentence was being imposed, the high court judge would put a black cap on and he would look directly at the accused and he would say, you will be taken from this place to the place of execution and there you will be hung by the neck until you are dead. God have mercy on your soul. Take him away. Yeah. Yes. Now, and the sentence was usually carried out either immediately or by the next morning. Yeah. <laughs> That's a riveting statement that should be mm -hmm. in the job description of any bureaucrat administering healthcare. So, Roger, uh, you you're a Cambridge uh, trained physician. You come out of that that tradition, and I know that you take the ethics of the medical profession very very seriously. Um, and this is one of the things that you find is very much an affront uh, is the behavior of not only the members of the medical profession uh, who have sort of either stood idly by uh, and allowed this to occur or have, you know, avidly participated in it, but you're also very concerned about the behavior of medical colleges. You want to talk about that a little bit about how this is really um, not only a destruction of, of human health, but also uh, really a betrayal by the vanguard of, of medicine. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? I know this is really something that you're, yeah. you feel quite strongly about. Yes, well, the, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta and others across the country 
um, historically were set up to do one thing, basically to protect the public from us. The two central tenets that they insisted on were first do no harm and informed consent. Over the last few decades, there's been a stealth attack on the way in which the college administers its business. It's now a most draconian, authoritarian, intolerant organization that undercuts those very tenets because during this mad period of COVID, essentially the college reversed its position on those two tenets. They specifically and emphatically told physicians that you will not talk about the complications of this so-called vaccine and you will simply obey under pain of losing your, what used to be called, by the way, a license. It's now a permit. We are permitted to practice medicine. Wow. We are permitted. It's a permit. Um, yeah, it, it's, you see, um, Leighton, we're, we're both professionals. In my opinion, the definition of a professional is someone who monitors themselves, themselves. We, the, we, we, we're expected That's a great to follow, definition. That's a great we're definition. We're expected to follow a higher ethic of monitoring what we do personally right. without someone looking over our shoulders. And the mm. organizations, these professional organizations that are, are now regulators, um, their sole purpose, in my opinion, should be to make sure that when complaints are made about a professional, that they go into action to investigate. Other than that, they should leave us alone. We're perfectly mm -hmm. capable of managing ourselves. Right, right. Um, Roger, you were one of the earliest people uh, to speak out, it, 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 not only about the mandates, the COVID mandates, but also the vaccines. You seemed so certain from the get-go that these vaccines were just not only a terrible idea, but extremely dangerous and said so. Um, what is it, uh, what, what made you so certain so early on that these vaccines were uh, a huge mistake that would be incredibly hazardous for, for the population? Well, without wishing to sound pompous, I'm, I'm a very well-trained senior specialist who's performed many roles in the profession but i've also got a lot of something that is in rather short supply called common sense you didn't have to be terribly sophisticated in medicine a, a medical student could have formed the same conclusion this was a massive experiment the biggest medical experiment in human history to inject people with a brand new technology that was totally untested and to expect you expect to get away with it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't needed. It wasn't tested. It didn't work. And it, it's now been shown to be killing people. For those obvious reasons, it should be stopped internationally immediately. No dithering, no tinkering, no no temporizing, no nothing, no. It should stop completely. And those of us that have been really studying this for the last four years are in absolute agreement on that. The mm -hmm. only people dragging their feet are the politicians and idiocrats, as I call them, who back themselves into a corner and just can't find a way of getting out. It's the old story. If it's not working, double down, double down, wait it out. You know, it'll all go away. Well, it's not going away. And w anyone in those positions and listening to me, let me tell you something. We're coming to get you. Mm -hmm. Because you have killed people under the guise of being better medicine. Mm -hmm. When it's certainly not. It's, it, it, I, I could summarize it late in this way. Not just with, with, um, COVID hoax, but with climate change hoax, oh, I, could, I could summarize it this way. These have been destructive solutions to imaginary problems. 
Mm -hmm. With respect mm -hmm. to COVID, I can tell you this categorically. If we had done absolutely nothing other than the way we've handled previous flu epidemics, absolutely nothing different, no one would have noticed. The death rate would have been the same. It's actually less than previous flu epidemics. It would have been below the radar. It was a manufactured crisis. Mm -hmm. now, now, Roger, uh, you probably saw this, but in your uh, former country, Great Britain, uh, recently there was uh, a, uh, a people's forum and their prime minister there, Mr. Sunak, he was, uh, he was addressed down by uh, a, a, a British citizen, an Englishman, who said to this, he said this to, to uh, Mr. Sunak, he said, I want you to look into my eyes, Rishi yeah. Sunak, and I want you to look at the pain, the trauma, and the regret I have in my eyes. And he said, he says, because of the COVID vaccines, because of all the people who've been, who've taken the COVID vaccine, he says, we have been left to rot. And uh, at the same time, recently, you might have seen there was a, a press conference with uh, Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida, and um, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya was on that call, and also the Surgeon General for Florida, who has banned these drugs in that state, to his credit. And uh, they were announcing that a grand jury is going to start indicting the people who uh, are responsible for uh, inflicting the, these vaccines, unleashing these vaccines upon the, the people of Florida, essentially lying to them about their safety and e efficacy. Meanwhile, and here's my question, here in Alberta, these vaccines are still available. Right. That, that, must, that must really <laughs> piss, piss you off. Uh, and so, but, but do you have an idea of why, why these vaccines are still available in our province right now? Well, uh, two, two general comments there. Um, the first one is just thinking about this very broadly. Um, the usual reason why anything is done anywhere in any industry for any reason is very simply put, everyone else is doing it. Ah. It costs money and time and I have neither. And I go further than that for the second reason. And that is, look, this is a population of 4 million people in this province. They, despite the top heavy administration that we're also very aware of and the massive waste of money because of that, they simply do not have the in-house expertise to assess whether or not a vaccine was safe and whether it was effective or whether it should even be stopped. They don't have that expertise. They would pull in sycophants from the university who were scared shitless of losing their positions and grants. So they just salute in the general direction of the people that are paying the bill. You don't bite the hand that feeds you. Mm -hmm. So we, we have here a situation where it's the idiots running the asylum. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, I find troublesome and rather incongruous uh, in talking about the Alberta government is that on the one hand, uh, they're taking a very strong position about the availability of quote unquote illicit drugs, street, what we used to call street drugs, narcotics, which are readily available in British Columbia, but which, uh, which the government of Alberta is intent upon, you know, restricting. But at the same time, the governor of, of Alberta says about COVID drugs, well, you know, we, we don't want to tell people what they can or cannot put in their bodies. And so we're making these drugs available to them so that they can make a choice. Uh, but the problem with that, uh, well, there's a lot of problems with that, isn't there? Um, would, you, would you agree with me? Oh, hypocrisy is rampant. Um, it's, and it's one rule for them and one for the rest of us. I mean, the higher up the chain you get, uh, the more you can dispense with whatever mandates and regulations there are. You may not even have had to get a vaccine injection in the first place. Right. Uh, no, d the double standard is everywhere in government these days. I mean, look at the climate hoax. You've got Kerry jetting around, creating a lot of carbon dioxide and thinking it's OK. Um, I'm sorry, I'm digressing here. No, but, that's fine. But no, I mean, they they um, 
they're holding us to a very high standard that they don't they don't hold to themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, in the meanwhile, though, um, you and some other very conscientious doctors, including Dr. William Macus, uh, Dr. Julie Polonesi, uh, uh, Dr. McCullough, world-renowned Dr. McCullough, Dr. Corey, um, you've you've gotten together and you've created uh, something called the Wellness Company, uh, which is designed to create health solutions uh, on a on a multidisciplinary uh, level, but to a large degree focused upon people who have suffered uh, injury and harm because because they've taken the vaccines. Do you want to talk about that company and that project and the work that you're doing? Yes, we're we're, we're I'm very proud to be associated with the Wellness Company. Um, Essentially, it's a company that is, is offering a more holistic approach to healthcare, and one particular avenue that they're commercializing is the use of various supplements that we believe can assist in recovery um, from vaccine-related injuries. And the principal um, compound there contains an agent called natokinase, natokinase, which is a derivative of fermented soybeans. Mm. Um, that uh, compound is um, is actually part of the, the food in Japan. Uh, they call it natto. It sounds like um, an enzyme. Is that what it is? Is, that, is yeah. it an enzyme? Okay. Yes, it is. It is. Mm. And it, it does a number of things. It, it blocks the attachment of the spike protein to the receptors on the inside of blood vessels. Oh, brilliant. Wow. It, help, it helps to degrade the spike protein that happens to be f floating free. And it has other um, beneficial effects as well. It, 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 it's very interesting. There's, there's always been an enigma in medicine. Why do the Japanese who smoke like chimneys <laughs> live, live longer than anyone else? And um, it could be that they're, they're taking natokinase because the other uh, a major benefit of natokinase is it acts as a very mild, what we call anticoagulant blood thinner. Um, okay. And of course, um, blood clots are one of the principal causes of death, causing a stroke or a heart attack. And so you have this simultaneous benefit of, um, of reducing blood clotting um, and also degrading the spike protein. Mm -hmm. I believe you have the distinction of coining the phrase clot shot. <laughs> to describe these these quote unquote uh, vaccines, which of course, as you explained to me in great detail, are not vaccines at all. Um, but uh, in in addition to um, providing products like that, I understand the wellness company also can provide um, remote online medical advice to people. And this is one of the things that, of course, is a huge problem throughout Canada and in, in Alberta is access to to doctors access to medical care so that's another uh sort of service that is available through the wellness company is that right that is correct currently only available in the united states um mm -hmm. it is being developed for canada and i'm wholeheartedly in favor of that it bypasses any restrictions under the canada health act because it's not a treating role it's a consulting role for recommendations uh, and opinions um, done very cost effectively in the States over the internet with Zoom connection between the individual and a physician. And the beautiful thing, of course, for it in Canada, when it gets introduced here, is that it, it could bypass that ridiculous um, uh, delay in getting to see a specialist once you're, if you're lucky to have a GP, once your GP has referred you to a specialist. I, I, I'll tell you just a little anecdote there on delay. Um, my wife um, has troubling headaches. And it used to be in our profession that one specialist would call another specialist and say, hey, could you see my wife tomorrow? You know, and we, we'd all bypass the system. We weren't supposed to do it, but it happened all the time. So I called uh, a neurologist that I knew and um, it, it wasn't his area of interest, but one of his colleagues, um, they got back to me to say, sorry, um, you see the triage for non-urgent cases right now is, wait for this, two years. Oh my goodness. 
you'll be dead before you get seen. Wow. So, no, I mean, that's just a little anecdote on the, the madness of the current system. It's in terminal decay. Mm -hmm. So if, if people can get access to a specialist of their choice within a few days and pay a very modest fee for that, um, that would be a remarkable advance for Canadian healthcare. Roger, um, a lot of people don't really have an understanding of how these vaccines, I call them vaccines, these drugs, mm -hmm. these experimental drugs, the Pfizer shot, the Moderna shot, the Johnson & Johnson one, AstraZeneca, how they behave once they are introduced to the human body. Um, I wonder if you could maybe just take us through an explanation of that and, yeah. and explain uh, why these drugs are so dangerous, why you call them you know, the clot, the clot shot, why we're seeing, you know, 14 year old boys and girls and, you know, at, at hockey arenas and playing fields and gymnasiums, sadly, just just dropping dead. It's, uh, it's so uh, incredibly shocking to, to see this. It's unprecedented in my lifetime. But could you give us maybe just a, a dumbed down explanation sure. of how these actually work once they're in the human body? Sure. Well, this, um, form of therapy is not brand new it's been it had been developed over the last 10 15 years in terms of the capsules that surround the mrna the lipid nanoparticles that that technology had been perfected as a way of trying to do de deliver chemotherapy for cancer patients it turned out to be disastrous because the the capsule itself turned out to be very toxic um, all they had to do was to um, mass manufacture the mRNA to put inside these little capsules in order to create this so-called vaccine. Now, just a little, a little side comment here in terms of mRNA. What is it? Um, mRNA is the messenger that eventually comes out of the nucleus it doesn't originate in the nucleus, but it comes out of the nucleus to create proteins in every single cell in your body that do all the necessary vital enzymatic functions to make the cells function and, and live. It, it's a normal molecule, a beautiful molecule that is the, the instruction uh, for the cell to make a particular protein. Now, what this new form of therapy is, is an injection into your arm with these little nanoparticle lipid particles, very, very small. And inside each one of those little globules of fat is this um, highly concentrated um, uh, array of mRNA that is designed to, to make your cells produce the spike protein that's on the surface of the virus so that theoretically, this is theoretically, so theoretically your body would then um, produce an antibody in the usual way against this foreign protein that would then theoretically protect you from getting the infection. Now, the, the way that the way that works is the the these little fat globules go from the arm. They never do stay in the arm. It was so pathetically obvious that they get into the bloodstream, go everywhere in your body, including the brain, the ovaries, every organ of your body gets exposed to, to these lit, little fat globules with the mRNA inside them. And the they are so designed that they attach to receptors on the um, on, on lymphocytes in order to be taken into the lymphocytes so that your body becomes the factory for the production of the spike protein, which is then meant to immunize you against it. Mm -hmm. That that's the general theory. Now it was brand new never been used for infectious disease before and could be predicted to fail 
because it hadn't been through any significant testing. But they did it anyway. Mm -hmm. And of course, there have been now all kinds of complications that that are resulting from that, that um, are causing the deaths and the disability that we're all too aware of. Mm -hmm. Roger, we had a a guest on our show recently named Gina Watil, and she's written a fascinating book, perhaps you've read, called uh, Fisman's Fraud. And uh, what she's done is she's taken a study from uh, a scientist named Fisman, and who essentially, she said, had inverted the data. And, and that is, um, his. he claimed uh, that this was a, it was all the unvaccinated people who were driving the pandemic to driving cases. But in fact, it was the other way around. So um, could you explain why is it that people who have been vaccinated uh, are actually the ones who keep getting COVID and, and are, are chronically, seems, seem to be chronically afflicted uh, and keep getting COVID, including uh, our our uh, our prime minister, if you believe that he got the vaccine. Yes, the, there there are lots of reasons. It gets very technical, but the the best lay um, explanation for that would be that this injection appears to suppress the immune system. Mm. Uh, the way it does that um, is is could be um, in a variety of ways, but when you suppress the immune system, um, guess what happens? You become vulnerable to other infections, recurrence of your shingles, for example. Um, you become vulnerable to repeated infections with COVID because the vaccine, uh, so called was intended to um, develop antibodies against the original spike protein, which is now different because of all the variants that have evolved. Um, So there there are all kinds of of reasons why the immune suppression um, takes place. Another consequence of the immune suppression is that um, people may not realize this, but your immune system is an absolutely vital element, uh, making sure that you don't die of cancer before you're 85. Mm -hmm. Um, Cancer is different from you. And that's the function of the immune system is to search and destroy anything that is not you. Bugs are not you, bacteria, viruses are not you, but cancer isn't you. And so guess what? When you suppress the immune system's 24-7 meticulous surveillance of every nook and cranny in your body for 85 years, killing off those very small cancers that we're all developing all the time, when you suppress that surveillance, you get the emergence of cancer or the emergence of cancer that was previously, previously under control as Dr. Mackis has said in many of his Substack articles. Right, yes, yes. So-called, so-called turbo cancers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the, 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 litany, the litany of issues that are coming out now uh, as a result of this clot shot, or is actually I prefer to call it now the death shot, um, given mm-hmm. how many people are dying. Um, you know, you have the, the increase in blood clotting. Um, You have autoimmune phenomena um, because of all the proteins that are being produced that the body is starting to react against. Uh, We can Mm -hmm. talk about that later. It's a concept called frame shifting. Um, There there are many ways in which these these injections are causing the the many and various problems that we're seeing. One of the things that uh, you're also involved in, and this ties into what you were discussing about turbo cancers, is uh, you're involved with a company called Mutant DX, uh, also known as the Liquid Biopsy Company. And what you're involved with there is developing these uh, mole- these molecular diagnostics, which can detect these cancers very early on and actually save lives. Uh, do you want to talk about some of the work that you're doing there with uh, with Mutant DX? Yes, we're, we're a, uh, currently an R&D company, but we're, we're rapidly going into pre-commercialization. We're, we're 
doing FDA approvals um, as soon as our current financing rounds in place. Um, we hope to be live um, by the fall, not actually in the liquid biopsy area, which is terribly interesting as a way of um, diagnosing cancer at its very, very earliest stage before you're ever sick, um, purely on the basis of a blood test, looking for the mutations that are leached out of the cancer uh, in very, very small quantities. Um, that's our second um, uh, project in the pipeline. Uh, the one that we're putting on the front burner is actually much more pertinent to the current problem, which is, um, of course, as everyone has heard repeatedly over the last four years, it was a, a pandemic of fear mm -hmm. based, based upon the notorious so-called PCR test. Right. Now, everyone knows in our game how terrible the PCR test is for diagnosing anything. It was never intended to be such a diagnostic test in the first place. All the test really does, PCR, is simply makes more of the stuff that you subsequently want to identify by some means. That's all PCR stands for, polymerase mm -hmm. chain reaction, making more of it so you can study it and identify it. Okay. Well, the, the so-called PCR test has a second step in which a mirror image molecule is used conceptually with a light bulb on it. A mirror image molecule is used to attach to what you've multiplied to see if it's there. Uh, a mirror image, lock and key, it attaches because of an opposite shape and, and so on. Right. Well, um, that's the ideal world, which unfortunately doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> because if if you your mirror image molecule is like this and you're actually trying to identify something like this perfect the light bulb goes off and you've got a probably a true positive on the other hand if the, the agent that you're using to identify this covid-19 spike protein finds something like this it attaches because it's got a little bit of similarity. Part of the lock and key is similar. It still sticks, and the, but the light bulb still goes off. Mm. So when there's a little bit of similarity, um, the, the probe, as we call it, the mirror image molecule, will result in a false positive reaction that we now know was 95% of the cases were falsely positive. Yeah. The asymptomatic carriage did not happen. Asymptomatic transmission did not happen. Um, the people that were being tested that felt perfectly well, who were coming down with a positive so-called PCR test, were not carrying the virus at all. It mm -hmm. was a totally false positive. Mm -hmm. Well, Fast forward to the to the this coming fall, we hope to be ready with a much better way of identifying um, any new virus um, with a, a very different technology that was the basis for the genome project. People might have heard of the word sequencing, where you identify the DNA not by this miraculous lock and key mechanism. Um, but in a much more definitive way by looking for the letters of the genetic code that, right. define, that define uniqueness for any, any organism. Right. And it, it, those are called signature sequences. They're well known. They're in the gen bank. Every butterfly and elephant, um, we all have random areas in our genome that is totally unique to that particular species. And if you can find that string of 12 letters, you know with incontrovertible accuracy that you have the right answer. Now, mm -hmm. we're the only company that can do that while looking for the half dozen other things that could be causing the same presentation. Not mm -hmm. everyone that's got a cough and cold has COVID. It could right. be anyone of, anyone of half a dozen or a dozen different bugs that can present in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. Real clinical medicine is called the unknown. You have a patient in front of you with a set of symptoms that could be a, 
caused by a variety of things. And your job as a doctor is to try to figure out by the history, by examination and by tests, on an order of probability, what's the most likely cause. Mm -hmm. So if you go into, you see your doc with a sore throat and a runny nose, um, you need a test that gives a yes, no, very accurately for each one of those possibilities. We're the only company that can do that. So, uh, Roger, I was asking you about whether um, this, uh, this issue you were describing about these excess proteins, whether that leads to clotting, but you were saying that actually that's unrelated. Yes, Th that's a very different process. And, and there, there are two or three different things going on there as well simultaneously. The first one is that our red cells in our liquid blood constantly repel each other. They don't stick together. Uh, it, it, obviously, it's a good idea to keep them separate. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they do that because there's an electric charge on each cell, each of the red cells. That, that, that re so they, the same electric charge, they, they repel each other. Now, one of the things that seems to happen with um, the spike protein is a reduction in that surface charge so that the cells are less likely to repel each other and more likely to stick together. We call that process agglutination, making mm. a, a bigger ball, a ball of cells instead of individual cells all floating freely. Now, it doesn't take much imagination to realize that in a very tiny blood vessel called a capillary, once you start having globules of these cells these red cells sticking together abnormally, that some of those capillaries will get blocked. The blood flow will stop. Um, and that's one mechanism by which the blood flow stops in, in blood vessels with the spike protein. The other, the other reason is that the spike protein has a very specific receptor on the inside of every blood vessel in the body. It's called the ACE2 receptor, and there are others too. The spike protein is attracted to those receptors on the inside of blood vessels. And that starts what we call the coagulation cascade. That, that, that inflammatory attachment of the spike protein to the inside of blood vessels starts the traditional blood coagulation process that we all rely upon to stop bleeding when we cut ourselves, for example. Right, right. So those those two those two processes result in um, a blockage of these tiny vessels, the capillaries. Mm -hmm. Now, what you're talking about is blockage of bigger vessels, like the veins in the leg, and these right. unusual clots that embalmers are finding at a, mm -hmm. when they preparing a body for 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 funeral. Mm -hmm. Now that, Have you ever seen anything like this in your experience? I know you've got a lot of experience in pathology, patholo uh, and pathological medicine. Have you ever seen anything like this in your experience, these clots? No, I, I've, I've done lots of autopsies in my career. Um, but I, I, the, there are always um, clots found in blood vessels after death. But they, okay. they, have, a, they have a different appearance. They're, they're more um, red jelly-like. Um, mm clots these mm -hmm. embalmers are, these embalmers are founding are finding clots that clots that appear much whiter and more fibrous um, in uh, in nature embalmers are finding a different type of of blood clot it's it's whitish in color and it's firmer and right. there's, there's 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 a real debate going on as to what um, these clots are made of um, my own opinion is that if these clots were so prevalent in the body of someone who was living, it's actually incompatible with life, um, that, that degree of clotting. I strongly suspect that these clots are being formed um, during death throes and post-mortem. And the actual composition of these um, so-called blood clots 
it may well be uh, a very different type of protein than we see with blood coagulation. Um, mm -hmm. it, it could be a result of um, certain proteins that are folding in a very, a very repetitive way to form something that has substance. Um, we call those that that folding folding prion like. Um, it, it, it's 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 an area that should have been explored with research much more thoroughly than it has. That you see. You see, Leighton, there's zero interest in funding agencies, whether it's NIH or the Wellcome Trust or government agencies. There is zero interest in, in thoroughly investigating what we call the pathophysiology, the mechanism by which all these effects are taking place. Right. And the very, the very simple reason for that is they don't want to know. Mm. They don't want to know because they feel it would be incriminating um, for their own decisions in the past. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's amazing. Well, when, yeah. when 20 million people are dying, you know, when we have the commonest cause of death in Alberta as unexplained, mm -hmm. when 22% of more children are dying in Britain, you'd like to think this was a national emergency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of national emergency and death throes and pathology, by, a, by way of segue, I know that um, you have some very strong views about the situation politically in Canada. Uh, you and I met uh, through our former mutual association with the Alberta Prosperity Project, and I heard you speak uh, very passionately about your love of Alberta and your conviction that Alberta's only path forward is to get out of Canada, become an independent uh, nation, independent state. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? I know, and people should know, um, you were uh, a, a central figure in the Freedom uh, Convoy. In fact, uh, we had Tom Morazzo recently on our show, and he's written a book, and, and you're in it. You're all over it. Um, so you're, you're walking your talk in this regard. You were there ground zero at the Freedom Convoy, but you feel very strongly that the only way forward for Alberta is outside of the current Canadian Confederation. You want to explain why you feel so strongly about that? When I was in Ottawa, I was a flag waving patriot. When I was with Brian Preckford in Victoria for the uh, anniversary of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, I was a flag waving patriot. I was honored to be accepted into this country in 1970. I've, I've enjoyed my time here in Canada. But it has changed. It has changed dramatically. And anyone, anyone who, who thinks that things can change by being nice, usual Canadians is dreaming in Technicolor. Tinkering will not work. You're pissing up a tree. It's been tried and failed. The power structure in this country is so tilted towards Eastern Canada, especially at the Supreme Court, that any contentious issue will never be adjudicated in the West's favor. Mm. So, uh, you know, I, I've been around this freedom movement now for four years, and I can tell you that I've reached the conclusion that the only solution to this is for Alberta to take control of its own destiny to put a fence around the property, call it our own, the Republic of Alberta. And once we've done that, we can then redefine all the institutions that are responsible for this dystopian mess that we're currently in, not just in medicine, but in law, in the media, at the universities, etc., etc., etc. Wokeism cubed. If I could borrow a phrase from Paul Alexander, only by burning it down to the studs is there any hope of change. Tinkering mm. will not work. Mm. When the APP was active in rural Alberta and I was on the hustings, there was intense support for, the, for a free Republic of Alberta. 
It's within grass, Leighton. Remember, René Levesque came within one percentage point of making it a reality for Quebec. Right, yes. Now, we can do that in Alberta. The, the sentiment is there. It needs really a charismatic leader to a, a peer like René Levesque, um, someone a, who's a rallying cry, a Churchill, if you like, um, who can... Just don't come along every day, do they? They don't come along yeah. every day, but history has a way of, of thrusting up a leader at a time of crisis. Very, and very true. Yeah, very true. They can, yes. come from the, they can come from left field, like Trump, for example. Um, mm -hmm. So if we, if we did that, it's not just that Alberta would be the happiest, freest place on earth, redefining dem democratic principles. And, but and rich. It's much bigger than that. We yeah. could be a beacon for the rest of the world, the rest of the world True. to follow. And the, there's yeah. already uh, there's already a movement to the right. Look at Maloney in Italy, Millet in yes. Argentina, Wilders mm. in the Netherlands. Everywhere you look, the German farmers, etc., etc. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely a movement to the right, and we need to ride that and show mm. the world. A better way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is to say, um, you, you're you not impressed with what you're seeing presently in the province with uh, Danielle Smith and you know, sort of the sovereignty movement. Uh, you think that really that's uh, really just sophistry that um, is really not going to change things ultimately, uh, that, that we need more of a more of a drastic uh, departure, a divorce, as it were, from the rest of Canada. Yes, you used a fine word there. Uh, in many respects, I'm not proposing that Alberta leaves Canada. Canada left Alberta a long time ago. The divorce ah. is over. What, what do you do in a divorce? You divide up the assets. It, yeah. if, I was, if I was privileged to have a very private one-on-one -on -one conversation with our premier, I would say, Danielle, you've got two career options. You can be the premier of Alberta for the next little while, constantly banging heads with Ottawa, coming home with a few crumbs, that would be one option for you. You'll never really win the battle, uh, the right. war. You might win a few yeah. battles. Right. Compare, th compare that, Danielle, with a much more interesting option for you as an ambitious, very intelligent woman. You could become the first female president of the Republic of Alberta. Which do you find more attractive? No. Yeah. Well, I, uh, that, that, uh, if I get the chance, I may just <laughs> lay that out for her myself. Of course, I'll give you due credit, Roger, as I must in my footnotes. Uh, but, it, but in any case, um, this has just been a great uh, conversation. So grateful for your time and uh and your knowledge uh, obviously uh your knowledge of medicine uh is so edifying uh it, you know in that you have the the ability and i would include you with some of our other guests people like uh you know like like dr mccullough and also dr Bhattacharya. you have this ability to take these complex scientific concepts and and make them digestible for those of us who aren't scientists which i, I really appreciate and uh, I try to do the same thing with, uh, you know, legal concepts. In fact, I, I detest uh, people who, who are in my profession, uh, especially professors, you know, who try to talk in this strange, uh, you know, language and use Latin and all that stuff to kind of confuse and mystify people. Uh, so uh, I just love the way you do that. And, and uh, you've made us, uh, honestly, this has like been like a crash course in understanding what these vaccines and the other scientific uh, concepts are all about. So uh, we're turning to our reading list now, and uh, the first book I'm going to recommend is one that I expect that uh, Roger knows very well. It's actually published by the Wellness Company. It's called The Next Wave is Brave, Standing Up for Medical Freedom. This is a wonderful book that I read about a year ago. It was published in September of 2022. Uh, the authors are Richard Emmerling and Heather Gessling and also uh, Dr. Peter McCullough, who's been on this show. Um, and essentially what it's about is it's been said that true wealth is good health and we couldn't agree more. 
millions of people have awakened over the past few years from a nightmare in healthcare, a corrupt ecosystem designed to keep patients dependent and physicians beholden to corporations instead of patient care. So this book promises a solution and says that we are part of it. And so it talks about the wellness company bringing together the brightest minds and bravest hearts in seven unique stories of courage, synchronicity, and hope. So I, I highly recommend this book, especially for any of, any of you who sadly are suffering through uh, the, the effects, the impacts of uh, having taken these, these awful drugs. Uh, the second book that uh, I'm, uh, I'm highlighting today, Roger's probably familiar with this one as well, is called Cause Unknown, the Epidemic of Sudden Deaths in 2021 and 2022. And here uh, the author is uh, Ed Dowd, but also Robert F. Kennedy was involved in this publication. Um, and it asked the question, uh, and this is specific to the United States, but certainly applies equally to Canada based upon the things that Roger has said here today. And it asked the question, what is killing young Americans? Uh, because what we're seeing is, uh, and it asked certain questions like, what has caused this historic spike in deaths right. among younger people? What has caused this historic shift from older people who are expected to die uh, to younger people who are expected to keep living? And so this book really goes into and asks a lot of the really hard questions that only people like Roger are really trying to answer. Um, so that one is one that I that I also uh, very much recommend. Uh, so Roger, turning it over to you, uh, do you have any suggestions for our viewers and listeners in terms of uh, things that they could turn to, whether it's a book or a website or a periodical or, or a study or something like that that could broaden their understanding of some of the things that you've been talking about with us today? Well, yes, a, a number of things, actually. Um, one excellent uh, source of information is the Brownstone Institute, which has a regular um, synopsis of, uh, uh, of um, issues, um, very interesting articles. I highly recommend it. Um, the other, the other thing I would say is, um, in terms of personal uh, activities, um, I'd like to share a little, a little story with with you and and uh, wonderful, you know, Ms. Um, Layton. Um, in my arrogance as a medical specialist, Cambridge trained and full of snot, um, in my <laughs> arrogance, I thought of naturopaths as quacks uh -huh. and um when i was when i was recovering from really bad covid my excellent gp who was supported by peter mccullough by the way he he was he really helped i was really sick and um my gp said to me roger now that you're getting better i i think you should go and see a naturopath i looked at her I thought, are you crazy? You know, um, I, I used to respect you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I went along anyway uh, with my oxygen cylinder. And this is what I said to Dr. Nowazek, um, who's a fantastic naturopath. I said, Dr. Nowazek, I'd just like you to know that I, I'm a fraud. Um, I'm not actually Dr. Hodkinson, as you think. I'm actually Humpty Dumpty. And your job <laughs> is to put me back together again. Well, well, what an eye-opener that was. This man is not a quack. Ho, ho, no way. He practices what you might call holistic medicine, a very broad kind of scan of you and what you should do and what you shouldn't do. Um, and he, he really, this is before I got involved in the wellness company. Um, he convinced me of the, the validity of, of using a lot of these agents, vitamin D in particular, um, and other agents too. Um, uh, but a, a much more lifestyle holistic approach to healthcare than the current five minute consultation with the GP about your left big toe, you know, um, right, right. very, very different approach. And I have the highest regard now for, there are still some quacks in naturopathic medicine, um, just as there are quacks in, in me traditional medicine, but, um, 
I, I've changed my opinion entirely um, mm -hmm. on what they're offering. Well, it's a sign, obviously, that uh, of, a, of a wise man that uh, you're continuing to grow in your knowledge and understanding. So I don't think that's arrogance at all. I think it's the opposite. I think you're showing great humility to admit that and to share that story. I don't think anybody watching this would describe you as arrogant. I would describe you as brilliant and, and courageous and wise. And uh, we're so grateful for you and for you taking the time to spend an hour with us to share your knowledge and your wisdom and your insights with uh, with all of our listeners and viewers. So thank you so much for being our special guest today, Roger, on Grey Matter. It's been our absolute pleasure to have you as our guest. Likewise. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Luke. Thanks, Roger.